Okay, so Tilly's going to be a great patient. She's going to have a lie down for us. Obviously, if the client needs help, um, I'll help her with that. This is also a really great opportunity to look at skin integrity. Uh, the client may not know what's going on, some of the risk at risk areas, or they may not want you to know. So this is just a great opportunity. Give them a quick roll, look at those um, bony segments that might be most at risk. I'll look particularly at the, at the luteal region, the ischial fibrosities, the sacrum. You also might want to look at the scapula inferior angle, anywhere where they're apt to get more pressure, um, have more bony sort of landmarks that are of worry. So we'll just, um, we would just roll her over at this point and take a look, see. Make sure that your client knows what you're doing and that they've given you permission to do so. Okay. Great opportunity though. And then we'll look at how these bony segments move um, with one another. So let's just remember um, some of our bony landmarks. Polypelvis is going to help us out here. What we want to do is know how each of these body segments moves in relation to the other. So first I'm going to start at the pelvis. Remember the pelvis is the foundation. We'll see how that moves in all three planes of movement. Remember that we have the frontal plane. That frontal plane is going to be your pelvic obliquities because it's moving in that frontal plane. It's also going to be your scoliosis. Okay. And then we have the rotational plane or the transverse plane. That's going to be your pelvic rotations. And then we have the sagittal plane this way and that's going to be your anterior posterior pelvic tilt. So I want to know how that pelvis is going to move in all three of those um, planes, and then I'll look at its effects up the biomechanical chain and down the biomechanical chain. How I'm going to do this is I'm just going to get right under uh, Tilly's pelvis, and I'm going to sort of think about scooping underneath, right? Scooping underneath that pelvis so that I can start to move it in all three of those planes. I'm not very strong, so I want sort of my body weight to be able to do that. So I'll show you all this in a moment, but you're going to just want to use your arms and the leaning of your body to move that pelvis. You're looking for how much does it move, what feels sticky, what feels particularly mobile. Notice that at this point I haven't looked for any of the bony landmarks. I just want to feel for how it's moving. And then I also want to know how movement here affects the trunk and how it affects the lower extremities. I'll also want to pay, pay particular attention to how it affects the spasticity, the tone, any abnormal reflexes. Okay? Then we'll start to look at, hey, can I put the pelvis in neutral, or how do we decide in looking at those bony landmarks? Remember that when we're, when we're making these decisions, we have to protect that trunk space. It's one of the key tenets that we talked about earlier. So if making the pelvis neutral means that my scoliosis gets worse, or my kyphosis, or you know, um, the lordosis gets worse, then I don't necessarily want to do it because I want to promote that trunk space. That's why we want to look. When we're moving in our pelvis, how does that affect the trunk? And vice versa. What effect does it have on tone spasticity? Okay. Um, before I get to Ms. Tilly here, I just want to point out the bony landmarks. These are your ASISs. In adults, our hip flexor is attached to that, so you can sort of slide down their iliac crest and find that hook for the ASIS. That might give you a really uh, an easier way to manage finding that bony landmark. If you can't find the ASISs, you can always find the iliac crest. Sort of go in here and take a look, see, press in, and you can find those iliac crests. If the iliac crest in your hand is pointing down, that's going to be an anterior pelvic tilt, independent of whether you can find the, PSI, the ASAS and the PSAS. If it's in an um, upward sort of position, then you're going to know that that pelvis is in a posterior rotation. Okay. Obviously, the textbooks are going to say, line up the ASIS with the PSIS, but sometimes that PSIS is tricky to find. Or if culturally or whatever your client just doesn't want you poking around in there, make sure that you're looking at the clues the body is giving you. Okay. One other thing to look for, maybe Tilly can help us here, if she's in an anterior pelvic tilt, she's going to have a really big lordosis, 
I'm going to be able to put my hand right underneath. If she has a big posterior rotation in her pelvis, her pelvis is probably going to be down, but she'll have a kyphosis rounding to her trunk, and probably her head will be up off the ground. You'll need a bunch of pillows underneath. So make sure you're looking for the clues that the body is giving you. Okay. To finish off the bony landmarks, PSISs, I find that those are more medial and also um, higher than I give them credit for. They might be right above the dimples. Have a look, see later on. Okay. Iliac crest, and then again, we'll be looking for protection of the ischial tuberosities. Okay, so when we're actually doing this um, on the client here, again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring her legs up and I'm going to try and scoop right underneath that pelvis. Now I've got pretty long arms. This strategy works quite well for me. I'll show you another strategy that might be useful if you have a client with really long legs or if your arms aren't quite as long as mine. But for my strategy, I'm going to get right up here. Um, I'm going to really relax to sit here. Also, make sure that you've gotten agreement from the client. Tell them why you're doing the supine assessment, what it's for, what data you're collecting, and get their agreement for this. Okay? We've already done it. Okay? And I'm just going to sneak her legs right into my chest like that, and then I'm going to scoop, scoop, scoop. Scoop, scoop underneath there. I want to think that um, the tips of my middle finger are coming um, quite close together so that I can get in and capture that pelvis. And then I'm going to lean back. That's going to be a posterior pelvic tilt. And then I can sort of scoop underneath and get her into an anterior pelvic tilt. Just again, we're seeing if I can move that pelvis. Okay. Next location, I'm going to rotate. Just sort of leaning my body weight over. And then I'm going to go to the other side. And then the next section, I'll slide down, and then I'll slide down. Again, I just want to know how that pelvis is moving, what feels sticky, what feels loose. Let's pretend we had seen um, a really nice pelvic obliquity in Tilly before. So we'll drop this side down, Tilly, and a nice scoliosis to that side. So I'm going to recognize, yep, probably that's what I saw in her wheelchair. And now can I correct it? So this side is low. This side is a little bit high. I'm just going to try and straighten it out. If all of a sudden that curve in her trunk gets worse, then that means it wasn't a flexible deformity. It actually is relatively structural or fixed. I don't want to collapse that trunk anymore. Okay? But for our case, we'll pretend that we can reduce that pelvis. Same thing would happen for a rotation. If she's high on one side, actually tell you do that for us, I'm high on one side, first thing I'm going to do is try and reduce that. But I want to make sure that she's not getting um, trunk rotation as a side effect. Okay? So Tilly, you're going to be reducible here. Okay? I'm just going to push down here and flatten on the other side. If, however, that was more fixed, non-reducible. If I give a push here, it either doesn't move or her whole trunk rotates with me, then that's not a reducible deformity because I'm all of a sudden um, reducing that space in the trunk. Okay? Relax. Now I can look for those bony landmarks. I want to try and find her ASIS. I'm going to find, I'm sort of look where I think that might be. I'm a little bit high here on Tilly, so I'm going to slide down, and there are her ASISs. Now what we're looking for is making, we'd like them to be even from superior to inferior. We'd like them to be even from up and down towards the ceiling, okay, so that we can neutralize that pelvis, right? And then the last one is looking at them in relation to the PSIS. I want to make sure that ASIS is on top of her PSIS. That would be your anterior posterior pelvic tilt. Again, if you can't find that posterior pelvic tilt there, look for the iliac crest. You mean the anterior? If she's anterior, now that uh, the iliac crest is a bit pointing down 
to our toes. That's going to be an anteropod toe. You can see the upper lordosa that that created. That'd be a posterior pelvic tilt. Now those iliac crests are more, the ASIS portion would be higher towards her nose. Okay, relax. So we're going to look first ASIS to PSIS or the iliac crest. We're neutral, anterior posterior. We'll look from sort of head to toe with Tilly. I'm the same, um, left to right. And then the transverse plane, we're the same height, left to right. Okay? That'll be that pelvis in a nice neutral position. Obviously, if you can't get there, that means that that's going to be a non-reducible deformity. You'll need to take it off on your assessment form and manage that when you get into the sitting assessment. Next, we want to look at her range of motion over that pelvic position. Here, we're able to get a really neutral pelvis. But if we weren't, we would do the range in that um, pelvic position that she could attain and maintain. Okay, I'll show you sort of the body um, positions for that. One other strategy, if you're a smaller therapist or you have a larger client, you can sometimes rest their legs on your legs. So I'll show you that strategy as well. So I'll just pick up both legs and put my leg underneath. Thereby, her legs are supported but I still have access to moving that pelvis. Because what I want to know is how that pelvis will move independent of the legs. Okay. My leg works quite well here. Um, if you weren't stable on one foot, you could always put a bolster or some pillows here, support the legs, and then you have access to the pelvis. Again, it'll be very easy to get into anterior pelvic tilt. It'll be quite easy to move them to deobliquify. It'll be easy in the rotational aspects getting them into a posterior might be sort of tricky, okay? But definitely now I still have access um, to, to what I'm trying to sort out here, okay? Now we'll move towards looking at the range of motion. Um, if you've moved them around while you're getting into that range of motion um, section, just make sure that you're looking again. Hey, are those ASIS's level? Left, right, up, down. Does the pelvis look like it's level? If it isn't, just give it another little wiggle. Or obviously, if you're keeping them in some sort of obliquity gear, that's where you're going to test your range of motion. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, I want to not have this pelvis move while I check their range of motion. I want to know how much hip flexion, how much hip flexion with knee extension, how much hip flexion with knee extension, with dorsiflexion, I can get. So I want to make sure that pelvis isn't moving. I'm going to keep my thumb on the base of that ASIS. Okay? And then I'm going to hook her leg around my, into the crook of my elbow. Okay? This works quite well for me. Remember that you'd like the non-tested leg to stay in that hook lining position. If we were to put that one straight, that's going to influence that hemipelvis, that non-tested side, to want to anteriorly rotate. It may affect the available range of motion. So keep this one in hook line, bent up like that. Uh, um, another OT can help you, a family member can help you, or Miss Tilly can hold it herself, which is quite helpful. Okay, so back. Maybe move that down just a smidge for us so we have good video. Okay, and I'm going to keep my thumb on that ASIS, and now I just want to see how much hip flexion she has. I want to move it and see how much she actually has. The minute that ASIS starts going to her nose, Tilly's going to help us here again, we'll come down. And then we'll flex, and now she's going to rotate for us. She's going to rotate. And she's also hip hiking on this side. Okay? That means I have exceeded my hip flexion, and the movement is happening at the pelvis. They do not want that. Okay, relax. So the minute you see more wrinkles in their shirt, movement in the pelvis, increased tone, increased plasticity, you're probably coming close to where that end range of hip flexion wants to be. Okay? I do do it a couple times. I just want to see what I feel, what feels sticky, what feels good. This hand wrapping also allows me to keep it just hip flexion without influencing into other ranges, such as external rotation or abduction. Okay. I would love to have straight just hip flexion in that single plane. 
I do want to check, check those other uh, motions, ranges of motion, just as they relate to midline. So I'll take a look at how much A deduction, how much A deduction, how much external rotation, internal rotation. But what I'd really like is straight, none. Okay. Now I want to look at hamstring range of motion. And remember that that hamstring attaches to your ischial tuberosity and then to various places on your tibia. So when I'm stretching it on that tibia end, if it's short, and those hamstrings do get short in adults or people with disabilities, it's going to be pulling on the pelvis end. And again, if we do too much of that, I mean, what are you telling? If I do more than she's got, it's going to pull on that pelvis end, and she's going to posteriorly rotate. And you'll see wrinkles, you'll see movement, you'll feel movement. I do not want that. All I want is femur movement in the acetabulum. Okay? Again, try this handhold. It works quite well for me. My arm is doing the majority of that work. And then I'm just wrapping my hand around their knee so that I can control, keep the hip and that amount of hip flexion, and then see how much hamstring range of motion you have. Remember what we're doing here. We're trying to figure out what seat to back angle of the wheelchair needs to be. We're trying to figure out what the frame angle, the frame angle, the front end angle, the hanger angle, what that needs to be. So the word, you know, she's comfortable sitting in that chair. Okay? Now I'll switch my handhold. I'm going to switch left to right. Keep the hip in that position. Keep the knee in that position that you wanted. And now we're going to look at dorsiflexion. We're going to look at straight dorsiflexion. Remember, you've got another two-joint muscle there, the gastrocnemius, the long head will um, cross both the knee joint and the ankle joint. So you want to make sure that you've got range there. doesn't count if we get a ton of inversion or eversion. You want to have a nice, solid foot for them to put their weight through. Okay. Check for spasticity. We tend to get a lot of clonus in that muscle as well. So just see what their available, maintainable range of motion is. Make sure that you are keeping hip flexion. You want the knee flexion that you want, and now adding in that dorsal flexion. Okay? Trying to set up what the angles of the wheelchair needs to be. If she was um, lacking hip flexion on this side, let's say I get to here, and all of a sudden we get a huge hip hike. Okay? And that's all I got. The more I try and press, the worse that gets. If I put her in a normal 90 degree seat to back angle on the chair, that's what you'll see. She doesn't have the range. So whoop, let's come back. I don't want the ASIS to move. I've got here, I'm minus sort of 15 degrees-ish. Now I want to look for what kind of hamstring range I have on top of that open hip angle on that side. Whoop, let's say I get to about here, and that's all I've got. That ASIS starts to move. That means I'm, I'm used up on my hamstring range. And that's going to be where that foot plate needs to go. Okay? That's how we're able to determine the ranges that are available. Okay? Make sure you test both sides. They could be different. And also gives you a nice cross-reference. Feel the tone. Feel the specificity. Okay, so now we're to the sitting assessment. And um, this is going to take into effect you know, all the things that we've learned so far about what their seated posture was in their wheelchair, about what the supine assessment told us, and now to the sitting assessment. Supine is all about what's possible. Now we have to put it into what's practical to do. Remember that we still have those three planes of movement. So we're still looking at our frontal plane, obliquities, our sagittal plane, anterior posterior, and our transverse plane, rotational. Um, this is a really great time to have two therapists. So we can have one at the back and we'll have another at the front. That front person can give them a little bit of confidence that I'm not gonna, um, you know, they're not gonna fall off the table. It's also giving you another set of hands. It's also giving you another set of eyes, okay? Right now, just for this really short webinar, I'm gonna do the solo, but realize if you had a more complex patient or somebody that didn't have great postural balance, you might wanna have somebody in the front there as well. Uh, I also like to have a rolling mirror so that I can see what's happening in the front, um, just to look at what the effects are. 
if you have maybe a client with um, a stroke or perceptual issues, you might want them to be able to view because how they feel themselves in space might not be accurate. Um, other clients, you may not want them to see what they look like. So you'll just have to use your, your clinical best judgment there. Okay? So first we're going to see what is her sitting balance. Can she sit unsupported? Tilly's quite good. She can sit unsupported. Um, if that were the case, I might look at dynamic balance. Can she put her hands on the top of her head? Can she reach out of her base of support? When she's doing that, where does the posture go? Um, I know lots of spinal injury patients that when they reach out of their, their um, base of support, all of a sudden you'll see those postural um, uh, postures come to life. Okay, so just look at what happens when she gets out of static balance and into that dynamic balance, and how can she self-correct. Okay. Next, we want to manage any of the asymmetries that we saw in supine. So first one I tend to look at is your pelvic obliquity because um, I can do that with things. Um, I've got fancy pelvic obliquity buildups. You could have just regular pieces of foam or you could have a rolled up um, towel, cushion cover, whatever you have. Remember if you have a pelvic obliquity that you've determined is reducible, you're going to build that up on the low side. Okay? If however it was fixed, non-reducible, you want to distribute the pressure, so you're going to build up on the high side. Okay? So for our um, example here, Miss Tilly is going to have an pelvic obliquity reducible on her right side. So I'm going to use my very fancy, yep, so she's low on this right side. I'm going to use my pelvic obliquity buildups, and I'm going to just move her over a little bit and put those underneath. And then I'll look for the clues given to me. First of all, did my scoliosis did get worse? Did I really tip her over? Look at my iliac crests. Are those now level? And I can even look at PSISs here. Okay. Um, for my example here, um, we had, I put um, almost two inches of pelvic obliquity. Let's pretend that's too much. All of a sudden, we got um, more curve in the trunk or those ASISs were off. Whoop, we'll remove one of those. And we'll add one back in. Recheck my work. Great. Okay. And now I still have two hands to do the other thing. What I typically will do here is look at the anterior and the posterior pelvic tilt. Generally speaking, we're sort of lazy, efficient beings. So we increase our base of support. We get um, a non-energy expensive posture, which is posterior rotation. Posterior rotation here, you can see it. Our ASIS is going to be higher than our PSIS and we're going to have a nice concomitant um, kyphosis here. We want to start at the problem, not the symptom. So I'm going to try and move that pelvis into a more neutral position. Okay? And remember what we're doing here is we're simulating. Okay? So I'm going to use my hands to simulate a posture. But I know that eventually i got to remove my hands and replace it with a thing, with a backrest, with a lateral, whatever. So just remember that when you're doing these postural corrections, your hands can force modulate, um, they can act in more than one plane, whereas some of our, um, our backrest things are only going to be one point, one pressure. Okay. So Ms. Taylor, your back's probably getting sore sitting like this. Okay, so I'm just going to um, correct that uh, posterior pelvic tilt, and I'm going to do that right at her PSIS, posterior lateral pelvis, and you'll notice that um, with you know, sort of an easier person to move, I'm just going to use one hand. I'm helping my elbows getting some support for my legs. You'll also notice that I guided her to where I wanted her to go. But the minute I can get rid of this hand, I want to, because I don't want to have to have that anterior support there. Okay? So that's one way of doing it. Or I could use both hands. Make sure that you're on their posterior lateral pelvis. You don't want to be on their lumbar spine because that's going to be a posterior to anterior sort of force. Okay. I could also start to use my legs. And so here I'm going to use my knees to just give her a little bit of support and maintain that neutral position because now I have my hands free and I can work up that biomechanical chain. So I want to now determine what my back height should be what the shape of that backrest should be, 
even in terms of um, side lateral support, lateral contouring. And I also want to think about what the angle should be over a neutral pelvis. So that's going to be sort of thoracic extension on top of the neutral pelvis. Okay? So let's pretend we're doing that. And now, um, Tilly, lean into me a little bit and let me take your weight. So, yeah, we're determining right now sort of um, what height of backrest needs to be. Obviously, if it's somebody that's um, uh, a spinal injury, somebody that's got pretty good trunk control, muscle control, trunk head control, I want to have that backrest as low as possible so I get good scapular movement. So for those guys, I might go sort of mid-back, mid-thoracic, I don't know, T, T10 or something. Okay. I do want to be below their scapula if I can, so that she can have that good shoulder mobility. If you can't find the scapula, just have her chicken wing her arms, and you'll see that that um, inferior angle of the scapula will come out. Okay. If that's not high enough for her, she's not stable enough, she'll just slouch down to make that backrest higher. Okay. <laughs> so most importantly, we're getting that backrest at the height that we need. Okay. So below the scapula for your active good trunk control people, maybe mid-scapula for people that just need a little bit more support. If they might be going into a tilt and space chair or using an anterior harness, anything like that, you probably want to go more towards shoulder height. This is one measurement that I will take while I'm doing the sitting assessment. I'll just mark my spot. Let's give you some trunk balancing system. Okay, right about there is where I want that um, back support to be. So I'm just going to mark, get my measuring tape, mark from the top of my finger to her seated surface, and I'll know that I want 17 inches of back support. Okay. Next, I might figure out where I want that lateral contouring, if I want lateral contouring. And let's say she doesn't exactly have a scoliosis, but she tends to be able to tip towards the screen. Um, she's just a little bit tippy, and I need some guidance to stay in the middle. Okay. Now, I've still got my pelvic support happening via my knees, and I'm giving her a little bit of a lateral hug. I'll also take that distance. That's where the top of my lateral contouring needs to be. Next, what does the back angle need to be? A little bit back towards me. Is she a little bit better with an open um, back angle? Just, you know, 5, 8 degrees, something like that. Does that give her... Um, a better head position. Let's go straight neutral. And if you jut your chin a little bit, that'll be like, ooh, you can just tell she's having to um, work a little bit too hard. She's too far forward. I can feel all her muscles um, starting to work because she's having to hold herself in gravity. But now if I bring her back just a little bit into my hand, open up that back angle. And most of your rigid back supports will have that disability within their headrest or within their hardware. Um, that's a really nice sort of angle, okay? So neutralize the pelvis, provide the back support in terms of height, back angle, um, contouring, and then we'll need to look at sort of the, um, the lateral scoliosis um, sort of asymmetry. So we'll do that from the front. Last one at the pelvis might be a rotation. So if we picked up in our supine assessment that one side of her pelvis was forward or one leg was longer, it would look, we'll come forward on your right, it would look something like that. If it's reducible, you found in supine, then you want to reduce it here. So we're just going to give some posterior to anterior force and some pull back on the other side. So I will give a little force and then a derotation force here. If it's reducible, she'll move. If it's fixed or non-reducible, we'll want to hold it there. Okay. So again, you want to pressure in your back support here is where that's going to come from, some sort of lateral wedge. And then this force is probably going to come from the ischial shelf of your cushion and or from an anterior pelvic belt. If they're using one of those. Okay. But those are the forces that we're creating there. Okay. Last we'll want to look at just the scoliosis. And we'll do that from the front-on position. I'm going to this. Okay, so scoot to the front. One thing I didn't mention before is that we do want to make sure her feet are supported. So in um, our simulation here, we just have um, a box underneath her feet 
or you can have a mat table that goes low. But do um, make sure that their feet are supported so they feel grounded in space. Okay? And then we'll want to look at what that trunk is doing. So we've taken away her pelvic bu um, obliquity buildup. So we'll want to put that back in so that we can keep her hips nice and level. And then we'll have a little bit of a scoliosis with a convexity to your right side. Okay, let's go big and broad. <laughs> and she's got a nice S curve because she wants to see the world at horizontal. Okay, that pelvic obliquity buildup is going to help our cause a little bit to reduce the pelvic obliquity. But now I need um, another reduction force here. So I'm going to use some pressure laterally to medially and then um, an opposing force above on the opposite side if I've got a correctable scoliosis. So first pressure and reduction pressure is going to give us that um, reduction in the lateral scoliosis, convexity to her right side. Okay. We know that another point of pressure might be useful. So I might bring in my leg on her pelvis here. So I've got my, my main force, my reduction force, at the apex of the curve, and then two opposing forces below and above that scoliosis. Okay. You know, making sure that you're realizing how much force that you're doing. Are you using any angulation force? Are you using two fingers? Or, man, are you really spreading your hand throughout that, um, that sidewall? You're just trying to figure out how big that lateral pad needs to be. Same thing on the opposing side. How big does that um, upper force need to be to correct that scoliosis? Okay. Just like we did before, start with the pelvis. If there's no obliquity there, manage that. Move up to the scoliosis. And then we've got one more curve that we might see, that S curve. Okay. So let's go all the way back. Give us a nice obliquity. Uh, let's go up. Yep, same side. So we've got a pelvic obliquity on the right hand side with her scoliosis concavity to the right hand side. And then we're going to see sort of an opposing S curve trying to make her um, gaze horizontal. Start with the pelvis. We're going to, and we're assuming that all this is reducible, right? Okay. So we're going to scoot that over, put your wedge underneath the low side, and then our scoliosis is still going to be there, but it's going to be hopefully a little bit less. We're going to give an, um, a lateral force at the apex of that curve, and then we're going to give our opposing forces on the opposite side, but we're most likely trying to keep your head tipped. Yeah, <laughs> but the other way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yep. Um, lateral on the right-hand side, and then the opposing forces, and now we're going to need to um, reduce this curve. Again, find the apex of the curve. It's going to be here. We're going to give it a lateral support and then maybe a lateral support up above it. Okay. Working your way up that biomechanical chain. The nice thing about this is I'm going to use my opposing force at the lateral to help me um, get that head into the line. Okay. Remembering that where you're putting your hands is eventually going to have to be replaced by Thoracic laterals, head supports, that sort of thing. Okay? We'll keep it, um, we'll stop it there. Angie, we'll push it back to you. Wow, that was some great information. The good news is, this webinar is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the resources available to you on wheelchair provision process and equipment through Education in Motion. I encourage you to visit the Education in Motion portal found on the Sunrise Medical website for even more valuable information, including additional webinars, printable resources, links to various industry websites and white papers, user case stories, and much more. Once again, thank you for watching, and if you have any questions or comments, do not hesitate to contact us.